In ancient South America, long after the dinosaurs took their final bow, another giant creature roamed the land. It was about the size of a small car and had such unique features that it could be mistaken for a dinosaur at first glance. However, it was actually a heavily armored mammal, the largest armadillo ever, known as Didicurus. This giant was part of the Glyptodons, an extinct group renowned for their large sizes and thick armor. Glyptodons were closely related to modern armadillos, particularly the tiny pink fairy armadillo, but they were much larger, being megafauna of their time and the biggest member of their order, Singulata. Although they went extinct a long time ago, could it be that they have been brought back to life? Stay tuned, because as it turns out, the Glyptodon story is far from over. It was discovered in 1847 and quickly became known as a large animal, averaging about 1.5 meters or 4 feet 11 inches in height, 3.6 meters or 12 feet in length, and weighing over 1.5 tons. This made it one of the largest Glyptodons ever found. There was some debate about whether it was the absolute largest, as others like the well-known Glyptodon were comparable in size, especially in weight. However, this uncertainty was resolved when a massive 8,000-year-old specimen was discovered, which was estimated to weigh an astounding 2,370 kilograms or 5,220 pounds, definitely making it the largest Glyptodon known. One amazing fact about this specimen, aside from its size, is that it dates back to the exact period when Didicurus disappeared. This has led many paleontologists to speculate that something caused it to grow much larger just before it went extinct. This increase in size might have been an evolutionary response for better protection. However, if this failed, Didicurus had two other notable defenses. Firstly, like all Glyptodons, Didicurus was almost entirely covered in thick, strong armor, similar to a tortoise's shell. Unlike tortoises, though, it could retract its head. The armor was made of bony deposits called osteoderms, which provided substantial protection for its head, body, and tail. The body armor included a large, pronounced carapace, resembling a dome, which was securely anchored to the pelvis but looser near the shoulders. This dome shape created ample space within the shell, possibly allowing for a fat storage hump, similar to that of a camel. Secondly, the tail was also well protected. The armor on the tail formed rings, providing additional defense in this area. This combination of size and robust armor made Didicurus a formidable creature in its environment. The armor on Didicurus's head was more limited, but still present, forming a bony cap similar to a built-in helmet. Despite its strong armor, Didicurus was not weak underneath. Its hind legs were particularly well built and served as the center of its mass, carrying most of its body weight. Some paleontologists believe this weight distribution allowed the animal to partially stand on its hind legs, despite being a quadruped. This ability might have been used for self-defense, observation, or feeding purposes. In addition to its powerful hind legs, which were crucial for swinging its tail, the second fail-safe defense mechanism was located in its tail. The tail was covered in a flexible sheath of bone, enabling Didicurus to swing it from side to side like a wrecking ball. The tail club, measuring about 1 meter or 3.3 feet long, was a formidable weapon. Fossils of the tail club show depressions that suggest the presence of spikes, adding an extra level of lethality to its defensive capabilities. With its flexible tail and powerful hind legs, Didicurus could swing its tail club at speeds of up to 40 kilometers or 25 miles per hour, with the very tip reaching around 54 kilometers or 33.5 miles per hour. This club, weighing as much as a cannonball and likely featuring spikes, could deliver devastating blows. However, this formidable weapon might have posed a problem for Didicurus itself. Due to its large shell and restrictive armor, it probably couldn't look behind itself well, making it difficult to defend against predators from the rear. Paleontologists speculate that the primary use of the tail club was for combat with other Didicurus individuals. This theory is supported by the evidence of damage on their shells that matches the shape of the tail spikes and corresponds to the estimated force of such impacts. The numerous marks on their shells suggest that the club might have been one of the few weapons capable of penetrating their thick armor. 
Even though Didi Curis likely couldn't see behind itself to fend off attackers, the tail club could still serve as an effective defense mechanism. It's possible that when threatened, a group of Didi Curis would form a defensive circle, using their tail clubs to protect all angles. An individual Didi Curis could also defend itself by swinging its tail wildly, potentially hitting an attacker. The presence of both a defensive club and armor appears logical when compared to its twin, the Ankylosaurus. Didicurus and Ankylosaurus are prime examples of convergent evolution, both developing extreme armor and powerful tail weapons, despite being unrelated species. They also shared similar lifestyles. Ankylosaurus is believed to have developed these features in response to the super predators of its time, and the same is thought to be true for Didicurus. But the one thing it continued to lack was good vision. Glyptodons had a unique vision quirk called rod monochromacy, a fancy term for lacking photoreceptor cells in their eyes. This meant they struggled in bright light, had fuzzy vision in dim settings, and saw the world in shades of grey, like an old black and white movie. These animals likely relied on their sight during twilight, nighttime, and cozy moments in their burrows. Even in the dense rainforests of South America, where sunlight struggled to filter through, Glyptodons could manage some limited daytime vision. Their hefty size and sturdy armor probably acted like natural sunglasses, shielding them from the glaring sun and giving them a bit of an edge against predators. Speaking of predators, fossil evidence shows that Didicurus was preyed upon by ferocious carnivores like Smilodons. But during the Pleistocene and Holocene epochs, it faced new threats following the Great American Interchange, which introduced many new species to South America. Native apex predators like terror birds were replaced by new carnivores, and Didicurus had to coexist with formidable predators such as short-faced bears, saber-toothed cats like Smilodon and Homotherium, and other large felines, including jaguars. This increase in predatory threats likely contributed to the rapid increase in the size of glyptodons, including Didicurus, as a defense mechanism. However, not all the migrating animals were predators, other new additions included horses, camels, deer, gomphotherus, tapirs, and New World rats. Native animals also remained, such as xenothrans, like ground sloths, anteaters, and other armadillos, as well as marsupials, toxodons, and native rodents. Didicurus, along with many of these animals, lived in open grasslands that were cold and humid, experiencing frequent cycles of glacial and interglacial periods. They were the ancient equivalent of lawnmowers, primarily grazing herbivores with a taste for tough vegetation like grasses. Their jaw structure tells the story, no incisors or canines, but plenty of cheek teeth to munch through their fibrous meals. Their jaws were built for power, with deep structures and bony projections to support strong chewing muscles. When it comes to their eating habits, glyptodonts can be divided into two foodie groups. The early Miocene Proplae hoplophorids were the picky eaters with narrow muzzles, while the larger post-Miocene glyptodonts were the buffet lovers with wide muzzles gobbling up everything in sight. Despite their different approaches, all glyptodonts had to forage close to the ground due to their fused neck bones and sturdy bodies. Their jaws' side-to-side -side movement was limited, but that didn't stop them from grinding their food effectively. In the species Glyptodon, the jaw's special ridges acted like nature's own food processes, constantly pushing and shearing food to meet their dietary needs. These ancient grazers were built with strong muscles and a flexible neck to help them snag their favorite snacks. This ancient animal liked to hang out near water bodies like lakes and rivers, enjoying a diet of monocotyledonous grasses and dicotyledonous trees. Despite their hefty size, they had lower energy requirements than most other mammals, allowing them to thrive, even on a modest intake of food. The massive species Didicurus roamed South America's prehistoric grasslands for nearly two million years before disappearing along with most other megafauna during the Quaternary Extinction Event. Despite its impressive armor and formidable tail club, these defenses could not save it from extinction. It's currently thought that climate change triggered the extinction of Didicurus, However, some researchers believe that its most deadly predator, humans, could have also played a significant role. As possibly the last of the glyptodonts, Didicurus coexisted with humans for several thousand years and was clearly hunted by them to some extent. 
Evidence of this comes from a particular specimen that showed signs of being butchered by early human settlers in South America approximately 7,250 years ago. While it's not yet certain if humans were the primary cause of its extinction, a secondary factor, or had little to no impact, with climate change being the main cause, the exact role of humans remains unclear. Regardless of the precise cause, Didicurus was a truly fascinating animal and one of the most remarkable creatures to exist in the last few million years. Now, since they were so amazing, there's a story flooding the internet that scientists actually went the extra mile and brought them back to life. It goes something like this. In 2020, scientists unearthed fossils in South America from which they extracted DNA of two adult and two juvenile glyptodons. Inspired by efforts to revive other extinct species like woolly mammoths and dodos, Smithsonian researchers collaborated with local archaeologists to de-extinct the historically massive armadillo. Robert Fleischer, a scientist at the Smithsonian, explained they used DNA from modern armadillos to rebuild the glyptodon's genetic code. It's a big project, and it might take many tries to make them as big as they used to be, but they're hopeful it'll work. Researchers plan to establish an assurance population, a group of glyptodons with diverse genetics in human care as they work on bringing back more of these creatures. Their ultimate goal is to reintroduce the species into its natural forest habitat. However, there's one concern that if the reintroduction is successful, the big herbivores could cause problems for the ecosystem because there wouldn't be enough predators to keep their population in check. Luckily, one of the main predators of glyptodons was Arctotherium, also known as the prehistoric short-faced bear. Robert Fleischer explained that these bears are relatives of today's Andean bears, so it might be possible to bring them back too. Now all of this sounds like an amazing story of teamwork, science, and the wonders of nature, but I gotta break it to you. It's all a lie. None of this actually happened, but it does explain how glyptodons would be brought back, if that were to ever happen. In the end, it remains to be said that glyptodons stand as iconic symbols of prehistoric megafauna. Their massive size, armored bodies, and unique adaptations tell us a lot about the ancient ecosystems and the complex interplay between species. As researchers delve deeper into their genetics and behaviors, there's hope for discovering more of their mysteries and perhaps even reviving them through innovative conservation efforts. Their stories remind us of the rich tapestry of life that once thrived on Earth, and how important it is to preserve biodiversity for future generations to marvel at and learn from. Do you think it will ever be possible to revive an extinct animal? Drop your thoughts in the comments below. And if you enjoy learning about ancient creatures, go ahead and smash that subscribe button, because this is where we unveil them all.